I want to welcome you again. And I think we should let out a big cheer because we made it here on the count of three. One, two, three. Yes, I'm so excited that we're here. And I might be a little bit more excited than most because I almost didn't make it. <laughs> And it's not because my car got a flat tire or because of the weather or anything like that. I almost didn't make it because I almost didn't make it to this planet. Basically, when my mom was expecting me, the doctors told her, your child is going to be born with a serious birth defect. Your child's going to be unable to see or perhaps unable to speak. And um, they knew she was exposed to the German measles. It's also likely that she was deficient in vitamin A, but for whatever reason, I was born with a birth defect. Um, I'm grateful first and foremost that I was born because the doctors actually suggested that she terminate the pregnancy. Um, but she didn't, and I'm so thankful. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and the defect was not visible to the naked eye at first. But upon examination, the doctors listened to my heart and they detected a problem. There was a murmur, a hole between the lower two ventricles. And it was about the size of a dime. And they said, if we don't do surgery, your child may not live very long. She may not live past 21. The blood wasn't oxygenating properly. It was a bad situation. So at the age of nine, they sawed my solar plexus, broke me open, sewed up the heart and put me back together again. And then they told me I could do whatever I wanted. <laughs> up until that time, honestly, I had had a kind of fragile childhood. They didn't know if the hole was going to get any bigger, so they told me to kind of be careful. I literally remember going to the amusement park and seeing signs that say, if you're pregnant or have a heart condition, do not get on this ride. And I was like, is that me? Like, I didn't know. And so I was kind of insecure in my body. I was the last one picked for the kickball team at recess, all the things. And so suddenly, after that surgery, I woke up and I had this huge T on my chest, a huge scar, but I also had a world of possibilities. And I thought, gosh, what do I want to do? Well, the first thing I wanted to do, honestly, was to thank God because I felt like he spared my life. It could have been so much worse. I felt like I had his protection when I was in the womb. But then as I got older, I realized I also wanted to take care of my body as best I could because I thought, gosh, life is fragile, you know? I want to, I almost made a vow. I didn't shave my head, but I was like, I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs because I want to make this body last as long as possible. And then I decided, oh, okay, I know how I'm going to help other people do the same thing, take care of their bodies and live a long time. We're going to move. We're just going to exercise. I was all about movement. I became certified by the American Council on Exercise, and so I thought, that's it. That's the secret. Just keep moving. doesn't matter what you eat. Just stay strong that way. And then a dear friend of mine told me about the Weston A. Price Foundation, and she said, Hilda, it kind of matters what you eat. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Um, and so I thought, of course, this makes all the sense in the world. Of course it matters what you eat. And um, I will go into more of my relationship with the Weston A. Price Foundation and, and all that I learned. But basically, I'm so thankful to be on this planet and to know that living healthily is multifaceted. It isn't just about exercise, but it's also not just about diet. It has to do with relationships and spirit and so many things. So today, I'm going to share with you five ancestral secrets for an extraordinarily healthy life. And these are things I've learned, yes, from the interviews on the Wise Traditions podcast, but also from traveling the world and connecting with indigenous people groups who have so much wisdom and understanding their traditions that are so good for healthy living. So I'm going to share with you some of the things I've learned along the way. My first story comes from my experience in Ecuador last summer. So I was standing on the edge of a creek bed and I was shivering, much like we're shivering right now. <laughs> I was shivering, but actually, I wasn't shivering because I was cold. I was shivering because I was nervous. Because Mama Rosita Colta, this healer and midwife 
of the Quechua people in the small town had invited me to participate in their annual ritual bath, el baño ritual. And I had no idea what this was going to be like, but I felt so honored that they invited me to join them. So I got by the edge of the creek, she said a few words, and then the community members started going in in small groups and she waved to me. So I was like, okay, here I go. I don't know what we're going to do. Um, and it was not unlike a baptism in some ways. She said, we're going to release the negative energies and receive the healing energy of the water. So we took like some stinging nettles, first and foremost, and we kind of self-flagellated, you know, to release the bad energy and, and get it off our bodies. And then she came around with a small gourd filled with water and she would scoop it up and pour it on us. And some of the men were screaming because it was cold. I wasn't, because I'm a cold adapter. <laughs> I didn't tell them that at the time. But anyway, <laughs> but um, they were pouring the water on us. And then another woman came around with some burning herbs. And Mama Rosita said some words in Quechua. And I was so struck by the beauty of the reverence that they had and the respect they had for the healing energy of the water. And it wasn't the only time when I realized how much they loved and honored what, what they call Pachamama, the Mother Earth. I got to be a part of this Inti Raimi festival, which I Googled before I went down there. I was like, what's Inti Raimi? And it said, it's a sun worship festival. Do not believe what you read on Google, <laughs> your results, because it was much more than that. It wasn't even a sun worship festival. A Pauki Flores, the Quechua man I met down there said, Hilda, it takes years to understand what this festival is about. But he said, in some ways it's like, after a mother gives birth, her body is depleted and exhausted and worn out. And the earth, after it gives us its harvest, is kind of in the same situation. So we do these special dances to kind of reinvigorate or revitalize the earth. And so, again, I was invited to be a part of some of these things. We shared a big meal. I felt like it was a Thanksgiving, you know? We shared a meal in the, muni the middle of the community square on this like large tablecloth and we ate some of their traditional foods of avocado and uh, chicken and guinea pig and it was just it was wild and beautiful but we also did this special dance that I said they've done it for for weeks they do it every year to kind of reinvigorate the earth and they asked me to join in I felt like a woman and I looked like a woman who had just dismounted a horse whose legs had fallen asleep. I was like <laughs> struggling, I was really, it was a sight. But I, I also did it, even though I was laughing at myself on the inside, I did it with great respect for what the earth does give us and for the one who created it. And the third story I wanna tell you about this connection to the earth was when I was gonna hike this active volcano outside of Quito called Cotopaxi. Volcano sounds good right now, doesn't it? kind of warm, the lava flowing. Just imagine that for a second. But anyway, so um, the woman who was my god, Nancy, said, Hilda, as we were talking, as we were approaching the mountain in her Jeep, she said, I don't invite every tourist to do what we're going to do, but I'm going to tell you something special that we can do. As we approach the mountain, it's important to recognize it, acknowledge it, and have it recognize you. And she said, so I want to ask you to, if you'd like to, put a little dirt under your tongue as a kind of communion of sorts with nature here. And so when she parked the Jeep, I got out and started to pick up some dirt. And she said, don't do it in the parking lot. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't do it here. There's gravel, you know. I was like, OK, OK. But we got to the part where we were going to hike up. And I put a little dirt under my tongue. And then she said, look. And indeed, the clouds kind of were parting, much as they will shortly, I'm sure, here. <laughs> the clouds parted, and she said, the, the mountain is greeting you in response. And truly, we had amazing weather as we were hiking up, and um, it kind of was like this, actually. <laughs> but it could have been worse. Um, so it was lovely, and, and she said, you know, I feel like the mountain received your respect and so forth. And as we were leaving again, the clouds parted, and she said, look, the mountain is saying ciao. <laughs> it was so beautiful. And I really am increasingly convinced that we need to get out in nature more. And even though we're shivering today, you all, 
It's important to experience all of the elements. Our ancestors did. They didn't have, you know, a nest thermostat in their home that would automatically, you know, get to the right temperature. You know, we cool our homes in the summer and we warm them in winter. We're in our cars with seated seats, you know, I mean, heated seats. It's just, we are too comfortable in a lot of ways, dare I say. And so to get uncomfortable, but also to experience the elements reminds us that we're a part of creation. And so I really am in great favor of uh, a respect and a communion of sorts with nature. And so my little secret number one is to remind us actually literally to get our feet on the ground. And I'm not going to ask you to take your shoes off today. <laughs> but I will tell you this. The earth is like Pachamama. The earth is like a mother who has wonderful things to offer you. As Joel was even just saying a moment moments ago, there is kind of a magic and a beauty in, in what the earth has to offer us. And we just need to open our eyes to it again and get our feet on it. Because, like I said, we're insulated in our homes, in our cars, but even in our shoes. And in some ways, the earth wants to take off our heavy load. We were talking about EMFs earlier today. The earth wants to take that positive charge that we get from the artificial radiation that we get from our devices and even the electricity. And the earth is like mama saying, give me your burden. And I have something I want to give you in exchange. And the earth in exchange gives us a negative charge, which can help us, you know, lower our cortisol level. It can help uh, attached to free radicals, so it reduces our risk of cancer and so forth. So the earth wants to give us so many good things. Let's connect with it in ways, even like this, embracing the challenges of it, because knowing that there's beauty in that too for our bodies. So secret number one is feet on the ground. And so I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me and even shuffle your feet a little bit. It'll feel good. Ready? Feet on the ground. Feet on the ground. Awesome. <laughs> secret number two. I learned when I went to Peru. So I had the privilege of going to this village called La Merced in this province called Aija. And it was two and a half hour bus ride up to the mountains in the Andes from, I think Cusco is where we went, traveled from. As a matter of fact, we were going so high above sea level, we needed to chew on coca leaves to avoid altitude sickness, I kid you not. So we get to this small village and I was struck by these beautiful children who had ruddy cheeks, but they weren't ruddy from eczema or allergies. They were, they were ruddy because they spent time in the sun. They were children of farmers, and so they were outdoors quite a bit, and they just looked so healthy and well. And I couldn't help but contrast these children with the university students I saw a few days later in the city of Lima. You all, these university students were pale, they looked frail, hunched over, and I was like, oh my goodness, for all their learning, they're missing the greatest multivitamin on earth, which is the sun. They're missing, they're not getting outside, they're under their fluorescent lights in their university library, they're in front of their computers all the time getting that blue light that messes with your melatonin. I mean, the contrast was stark. And I could go on and on, but you should probably just listen to the Wise Traditions podcast <laughs> episode I did with Matt Maruka actually on light. And I've done several on this, but I will say that with my own eyes, I can see that we all need more of the nutrient, more time in the sunshine. So secret number two is face to the sun. So repeat after me and kind of look where the sun might be. <laughs> face to the sun. Face to the sun. Awesome. Secret number three, I was brought home with me when I went to the town of Oiti near Tanzania with some Maasai friends. I didn't go just because I thought, oh, let me go see if I can meet some Maasai people in Kenya. I went because this Maasai warrior, Dixon, he called the Weston A. Price Foundation. He said, please send someone over. We're all getting sick. He said, I have diabetes, my wife has asthma. You guys, the Maasai are known for being this like hale and hearty tribe of tall, strong, healthy people. And he had seen the physical degeneration of his people. He had gotten a hold 
of some of the Weston A. Price Foundation brochures, and he saw what Dr. Price had discovered in his studies like 100 years earlier. Dr. Price is a dentist researcher from the 1930s who traveled the world looking for isolated indigenous people group who were healthy and well and he wanted to see how they were eating and what they were living. I mean, how they were eating, no wait, what they were eating and how they were living. <laughs> it is a little cold. <laughs> um, and so he went all over the place. He went to Switzerland and Alaska, the South Sea Pacific Islands and Kenya. And what he found was the isolated indigenous people group who were not affected by modernity were, modernity were eating their traditional diets and they were healthy and optimistic and fertile and full of vitality. The chicken agrees. <laughs> I can hear her walking there. Um, and those who departed from their traditional diets and traditional health ways were starting to suffer from the chronic conditions that he saw in the Western world, Dr. Price did. He documented all of this stuff in his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. But what I'm trying to get at is, with Dixon's own eyes, he saw in his own village the same thing Dr. Price saw, that as they began to incorporate Western dietary principles, like you know, flour and sugar and oils, seed oils and stuff, he saw that his own people were suffering. So I went over there, I had the privilege of speaking with them, and it was so wonderful. I said, don't eat our way. <laughs> Don't eat the American way, eat your way, what has served your people for millennia. And I met a man there, a warrior in the tribe who was like 100 years old, Ole Sanku. And he was amazing. He walked up to speak with me only with the help of a cane. And he was so well. And I immediately grabbed my phone. This is before I started the podcast, but I was like, I gotta, I've got to get what he says on my phone recorded here. And I hit voice memo and I said you know please tell me through a translator you know what did you eat when you were a child how did you live and he said when we were little we didn't get sick we never got sick he said if we felt a shiver coming on we would just drink milk from the cow and he demonstrated drinking from the udder <laughs> raw milk right <laughs> where are my raw milk people at <laughs> yes yes I love it so much so, and then he said, and now they say, oh, cold is coming. We have to get jackets. And my great, your grandchildren have to wear jackets. He said, but we didn't have jackets. And he said, now they say disease is coming. We have to get shots. We didn't have shots. So it was amazing. I said, well, tell me more. Tell me, what did you eat? He said, whatever we could catch. <laughs> we hunted. We hunted. Wild game was our diet and maybe some fruit and wild honey. That was it. So you see, it was food without labels. And in our alternative health circles, sometimes we're like, oh, okay, this says paleo on it, or you know, natural fat or whatever. We're like, okay, that's great. It wasn't packaged. It was real food, single ingredient food that they turned into something that they could consume and that they would enjoy together. So um, this is secret number three, is food that nourishes. Repeat after me and rub your stomach. It'll feel warm. Food that nourishes. <laughs> all right, we're gonna review all three. Um, Number one, feet on the ground. Feet on the ground. Face to the sun. Face to the sun. Food, that Food that nourishes. Excellent. I have two more. This one may be the most profound. I know it's been very life changing for me. When I went to Australia, I had the privilege of connecting with some Aboriginal women. And you know, just like the Native Americans, they have a lot of different tribes. They came from different tribes. Suzanne Thompson was from the Inangai tribe. And she said to me, Hilda, I was, I was gonna be a hairdresser for a Vidal Sassoon salon. And now I call myself the ancestral whisperer. She said, I have custodianship of Gracevale Station, land that was once occupied by my ancestors. You all, she toured me around and I got to see things that you only see in museums cave walls with like handprints on them that they had painted on with using blood and urine and uh, you know impressions of emu feet and all these things I was just blown away and she also said to me Hilda look at this land she said this is our grocery store I was like wow they ate off the land you know and 
just a little aside, one of the saddest moments I had was in a region there called Manangrida, and it was like a reservation for Native Americans. And there were Aboriginal people there. They'd been removed from wherever they had lived before. They were living in this town, and they were all buying their food from one grocery store. And I saw them walking out with bottles of colored juice, you know, juice in quotes, and, and I was so saddened, and the people there were so unhappy. I even met a young woman at a 7-Eleven place called the, the Hasty Tasty. <laughs> I kid you not. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came to visit. She said, why, why in the world would you come here? It was so sad. Um, but so going back to my friend Suzanne Thompson, uh, she and her friend Eve White said, Hilda, the reason, well, actually, Suzanne said, the reason I am now custodian of this land that is so beautiful and no longer a hairdresser is because I listened to my dreams. I, I stopped to listen to what my ancestors want, would want me to do. And Eve White told me the custom in her tribe is called didiri, not to be confused with the didgeridoo, <laughs> which I think is an instrument down there. Didiri is deep listening. It's a, it's a custom of deep listening. And I love this because I think it's fine to hear people speak from a stage. And I, I love that people listen to the podcast. But I feel like we all have a deep wisdom within us that if we stopped listening to the chaos and all the verbiage out there and started listening more inside, we would have a better idea of how to live a healthy, optimal life and to do what our true purpose is here in this world. So she told me this custom to Deary, and I thought, wow, yeah, this gives us, this custom of quiet gives us a freedom from chaos and a freedom from fear to really listen. When you stop and listen, you may hear what your ancestors want for you, you may hear what your body needs or what your intuition or conscience is telling you. So this is secret number four, and I'm just going to call it because I like a, alliteration. Everything has started with an F, in case you haven't noticed. Um, so this one I'm just going to call freedom from fear. Freedom from fear. All right, so we're going to repeat again, all of them. Feet on the ground. Feet on the ground. Face to the sun. Face to the sun. Food that nourishes. Food that nourishes. Freedom from fear. Freedom from fear. And the last secret I'm going to share with you has to do with something that we're experiencing right now. It's not the cold. <laughs> it's not the cold. It's something that every single community I visited had, and it was just that. It was community and connection. We weren't meant to live alone. God knew it, said it early in the book of Genesis. It was, it's not good for man to be alone. We really need each other's energy. This is why I love that we have the podcast away. Technology is great. It's a way to communicate with one another. I love, I can't say I love Zoom calls, but <laughs> I, I do like using technology for connection, but nothing beats being together in person. I might post these talks you know, later on YouTube. That's great. People can enjoy it to a degree, but there's something intangible and beautiful about being together and in person. Um, I have a story to tell you too from Ecuador. So when I was in the town of Santa Barbara, this woman, Christina, said to me, you know, in 2020, Hilda, a lot of people in our community got sick. They got COVID, whatever that is. <laughs> um, and she said, what we did, a bunch of women and I gathered medicinal herbs and plants, about 20 medicinal herbs and plants, and we took them to each household. And she said, no one was hospitalized and no one died. And I was like, wow, can I see the list of medicinal plants and herbs? <laughs> I was very curious about that. And she, she couldn't get it to me. But then I thought later, you know what? It doesn't matter. I don't think it has to do with those plants, to be honest with you. It's the context in which they were given of love and support and community. So secret number five, you all, lightly touch your neighbor's shoulders and say, friendship. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're going to review all five. Feet on the ground. Face to the sun. Food that nourishes. Freedom from fear. 
friendship. Friendship. Yes. I'm telling you, most especially, if you walk away with nothing from what I've said today, hold on to this one thing if you can. That if you take time to be still, you may hear what your ancestors want for you, you may hear what your intuition is telling you, or you may hear the very voice of God. Thank you.